Mexico City and I learned a couple of things. Buenos dias, familia. Agradecidos de estar aquí todos. Estoy emocionado de aplicar de la palabra de Dios esta mañana. Abuela said that was good, so that was good, amen? But uh, good morning, family. I'm grateful to be here with everyone. And I'm excited to be able to preach God's word this morning. Let's turn our Bibles over to Philippians chapter 3. Yes, sir. Come on. You know, instead of some come on, bros, this morning, let's get some vamos, hermanos. You know, I believe we're in a moment here as a family. I believe we're in a position here as a church, as a super region, the metro coast. I believe we're at a turning point that we will never come back here again. But we will make history this next half of the year. You know, I am so excited to see what God is going to do. We just came back from Mexico and we heard all about being limitless. And I believe by God and his spirit, he wants his people to be limitless. Limitless in their impact. Limitless in making the world a better place. Limitless in our lives. Limitless in our families. Limitless in our spirituality. Limitless in all areas of life. But I believe what I took most out of the Mexico City Conference was the fact that it's time now as we're heading into the second half of the year. We took this little intermission called summer. Some of us got some vacations. Some of us went to Mexico. And a lot of you guys are out of school. But right now is the moment for us to truly figure and focus on how to become limitless. And I believe it starts with something. Not focus on being limitless. But I believe it's time to focus on renewing with God. And that's the title of my lesson this morning. Renewed with God. God. Philippians 3, I just got two points for you here this morning. In Philippians 3, in the latter half of verse 4, the Bible reads, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, whose for sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And the church said, Amen. You know, this is such a powerful passage of scripture. You know, this book here was written in 62 AD, just about five years out from what would become Paul's death, his beheading in Rome. He's currently in prison, and he's writing to the church here in Philippi. And what he's writing to, the, the, the narrative of the book of Philippians is one of joy. Because in their time, in his time of being in prison, the Philippian church would often send him refreshing supplies and whatever he would need. They would tend to whatever Paul would need. And so he's writing to them. You see a different narrative amongst the other books. In Corinthians, it's, it's very authoritative and, and corrective here. But here at the Philippians, it's one of joy. Can you imagine Paul sitting in prison, waiting his trial for death, 
And in this time, he's currently making an impact on all the royal guard in Caesar's palace, preaching and proclaiming the gospel of God's grace. And as they're facing an immense amount of persecution, he reminds them to be joyful in what they have. It's incredible because right now he's dealing with what they were facing, which was some persecution from the circumcision group. And what he says here is he says, whatever these people would put their confidence in, I have more reasons to put my confidence. He says here, he says, circumcised on the eighth day, I actually am a child of Abraham. I'm under that covenant. He then says, right after that, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, what, what, why would he say of the tribe of Benjamin? Well, Benjamin actually was the one that gave Israel their first king and King Saul. It was, also, it was also one of the only tribes that remained faithful to the law of God when all the other tribes abandoned it. And one of their greatest accomplishments would have been Saul, which would become Paul, as the prophet, as the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul here is writing, he says, whatever they think they would have confidence in, I have more reasons than anybody. I've been faultless in my legalistic, my, my legalistic righteousness of holding the Mosaic law. I have not made any mistakes. Gamaliel, I mean, you guys have to imagine here. Paul was trained by Gamaliel, the top Pharisee. And to understand the level of this guy's influence, I, I don't think we can all the way grasp it. But from ages five to nine, you would undergo a process where you would be selected, every Jewish boy would be selected, and you would have to memorize word for word Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then the top 1%, because 99% of the people in that time would not be able to pass that. You would go on if you were that top 1% to the ages 10 to 13, where you would have to memorize from Genesis to Malachi. Now to understand this level of test, the rabbi would stop at any random moment, would not tell you the book, would not tell you the chapter, would not tell you the verses, and would not tell you when to stop, and he might not even stop at a period. He would simply begin reading in a random book, and you would have to know it so well, he would stop, point at you, and say, begin reading, begin reciting. And he wouldn't tell you when to stop. So we're not dealing with just an ordinary guy that was just a part of the Sanhedrin and part of the council. This is the top 1% of the top 1%. And so when he says, if they have, think they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I was one of the only Pharisees that was actually zealous about my convictions. I actually took out the law of my God that I thought it was in my wrong interpretation. But here it says, after all that, he considers it rubbish. He says nothing compares. Nothing can hold a can. Nothing can measure up to the surpassing glory of just knowing God. Knowing Christ. He says, I just, at this point in my life, you would think that he would just want to escape death. But he says, no, I'm not focused on the circumstance. I'm not focused on the persecution. I'm not focused on what could potentially happen to me in the next couple of years. I'm focused on one thing. I want to know God. My first point for you is renewed pursuit. You know, Paul here coming to the close of his life renewed his vigor, renewed his desire in an even greater way to just want to pursue his relationship with God. He says, I don't care what I get. I don't care what I don't have. I don't really got much. This is a pretty dark and gloomy dungeon here, but I have what's most important. I have my relationship with God. You know, I, I titled this point Renewed Pursuit because I believe we can get caught up in pursuing many things. You know, I believe us as human beings, we are fickle. That's just our nature. That's just who we are, which is why we have words called renew <laughs> or consecrate, because it's to go back and start where you began. <laughs> but I believe here that we, we have to come into terms with our mortality and realizing that though we are sitting and filling up these seats, we could be distracted by what we may desire or what we may want to pursue. Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes 3.
Ecclesiastes 3. Let's get an amen when you guys get there. Amen. It says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 9. It says, what does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. You know, I, I remember first reading this passage of scripture when I was a very young Christian. And I, I, I was studying the book of Ecclesiastes because I had a very, uh, very worldly background, to say the least. And uh, I, I found myself being fickle and not being able to stay focused and stay committed because I was just so wrapped up in my desires and my emotions and what I wanted to do. And I always asked, why am I like this? You ever just ask yourself that? Just get in the morning. Why? Why do I, why do, I do this to me? <laughs> You ever seen that meme where you're, you're looking in the mirror, you're, you're confronting the person that's rupturing your finances? You're looking in the mirror, you're like, dude, this is your fault. And, and you're looking at yourself there. <laughs> but I asked myself that question and came to this scripture, and I found out just why we are the way we are. The Bible teaches here that God has set something, he's placed something in our heart. It says he's placed eternity in your heart. And so there's this innate human desire in you that you need more, that you want more, that you want to do more, that you want to accomplish more. And whatever more you get to, it's never enough. You just want to continue to get more. We, in every real way, as it says, as I close this, this section right here, it says, everything God does endures forever. So it says God does this for a set purpose. Because though if you don't seek God, you're going to pursue many other things. But God's waiting right there in the wings just looking and saying, when is he going to stop looking around and simply look up? Because I will fill that eternal size hole in his heart. I find that there's something we must accept about us. <laughs> if we're going to be renewed in our pursuit... We have to accept the fact that we are constantly fighting to fill that God-sized hole with temporary forevers. We desire things that are a great experience in the moment, but they last for just a short while. You know, I was preaching to Kids Kingdom here this morning, and I asked around, I said, hey, what are some things that people pursue? What are, what are people pursue? And I just, just a basic question, people. That, 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 it's a general. And they gave many answers. A couple of them were titles. People desire titles. They want to be at a certain place where people, they have a title that people respect them for. Yeah. Status. I may not want the title, but I sure want the respect of my accomplishments. I want people to look at me and know who I am without even introducing myself. Recognition. I just want to be lifted up. I just want people to acknowledge me and give me the, the acceptance and unfailing love I've always been looking for. Money. People desire, they pursue money. So much they revolve their life around this pursuit. Possessions. Whoever acquires the most toys wins. People pursue intimacy. Thinking that they're going to get those emotional needs met that parent figure never gave them in a partner because this is the height of the emotional experience as a human being. People desire intimacy. Pleasure. Whatever feels bad must be bad and whatever feels good must be good. People desire to climb a, a, a sort of ladder. It could be school, it could be, it could be in, the, in the business world, it could be in any arena of life, but people desire to climb a ladder. They pursue relationships. They pursue success. And I think the number one thing for our generation is the pursuit of attaining a certain image. In fear 
of seeing that image shatter. We are touted as the most egotistical generation. We are so focused on how people perceive us that instead of focusing on developing the content of our character, we focus on having the greatest personality. We focus on just what people see on the outside. And so we pursue temporary forevers. You know how you know if you have a relentless or, for the sake of it, a limitless pursuit of God? Turn over to Psalm 119. You know, maybe you read this scripture once or twice. Maybe you've been in a Bible study here this past week where you utilize this scripture. But I think for us, we can get so caught into teaching the scriptures and applying the scriptures to other people and giving it to other people and telling them all the intricacies and, de and, and, and the nuggets that you find and attaching it to this scripture, new ways to teach the seeking God study and all these other things. But we can fail to apply it to ourselves. We can fail to, instead of just doing the seeking God study with others, Check ourselves, and maybe right now we need to renew and do the Seeking God study with ourselves. Yeah. To figure out, you've got to come to terms. Did you come fill up these seats because you're seeking one of those things I just listed off? Or did you come here to truly, just as Caleb welcomed us with, to praise God and to seek God with all your heart? But how do you know? It says in Psalm 119, verse 1, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. You know, we understand the Hebrew of this word blessed. It's esher, which then translates to English superlative happiness, which means that God desires us to be happy because he understands, it says in Ecclesiastes 3, that that's what man desires. Yeah. And so he wants that for us. But he mentions this not as the focal point of our pursuit of him. On, he mentions it as a byproduct. Yeah. But here's the thing. This scripture does teach us that there is an evidence for if you're really seeking oh, God with yeah. your whole heart. Is joy. You can really find and tell if you're seeking God with all your heart, if you don't need the circumstances to be just right for you to be joyful. If the persecution is spiked up, you can still be joyful. If your parents don't agree with you raising your pledge, you can still be joyful. If, if your brother or sister just didn't do the dishes this morning, you can still be joyful. If you're feeling a little under the weather, Mexico City, amen, you can still be joyful. This is the test. Because if your relationship with God, and I'm not saying, I'm not above this, it's natural. Okay. It's natural. You, you start to things to, to really, really interject on your relationship with God. They start to, start to intervene and knock you off course a little bit. You were seeking God fired up. You were ready. Do you remember when you first looked at the scripture and they were like, well, you got to have quiet times. You got you to study the Bible every day. Eagerly examine. Eager, eagerly examine. <laughs> Amen. Don't eagerly just read. <laughs> eagerly examine. Give it clear devotion. Because we examine Instagram. We, 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 we can examine Facebook. And you can even be interested in things that should not be really having your interest. Like reading those persecution posts and just getting so caught in, you know every detail to go recite to your friends, but you don't really know the book of James that you just read this morning. We can pursue us in the ministry. We can pursue taking care of the ministry's needs and not taking care of the one who's going to take care of the ministry's needs. 
you can forget what this pursuit is all about. It's not about what you get. See, the way to really examine this is, what if I had nothing I ever desired? The reality is that should never be the case. Because with God, you should have everything you desire. And so for us, I, I really want to bring us to a point of re-examining. And it's a question you've heard before. But the question is simple. Is God enough? Is he enough? Is he sufficient for you? Or is marriage more important? Is being in a relationship more important? Is your wedding day more important? Is your kids more important? Is your culture more important? Or like Paul, do you consider it in comparison to knowing Christ, it's dross. It's less than what I absolutely don't even care if I don't have, if it means I have God in heaven. Now, I believe it's time to renew our pursuit. As it says in the scriptures, you were running a good race. What cut into you? What has knocked you off course? You know what? I'm a take it lightly person, which means that I can fundamentally have the house burning down and I can just be sitting. Ole talked about this at Devo and I was like, I never related to anything more. But he said, there's this gif where there's this cartoon character sitting at his kitchen table and everything's on fire around him. And he's just sitting there, this is fine. <laughs> I'm going to take it lightly like that, where I can probably have everything going wrong. And I'm like, I'm quite sure I could take care of all this. <laughs> it's not even that big of a deal. It's fine. We're going to be good. And uh, which there's a strength to it. But the weakness to it is you can be very self-deceived. Yeah. And you cannot really self-examine. To see where you really are in your pursuit of God. See, Paul said in legalistic righteousness, he was faultless. Meaning that on face value, he was doing everything correctly. Us as disciples, you could be fundamentally functioning correctly and have a legalistic righteousness. You can totally fill up every seat in the pews, be at the midweeks, you're fired up, you're studying, you checked off the quiet time for the day. But you only did it just in case somebody asked you. And it wasn't really your pursuit of God. But it was your leader's pursuit of holding you accountable to, for you to pursue God. We've got to renew that pursuit. You know, when I think about pursuit... I think about pursuing my wife. Here's the thing. I got in. Um, I'm quite sure I'm one of the greatest forerunners of the phrase slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Not for good reason. Um, because I was aggressive. I wanted to marry this woman and I was going to do it. And um, <laughs> I, I got disciples, so we're good. I'm clear. I'm clear, all right? <laughs> I got so much discipling. I got caught speeding like four or five times, you know, where I was like organizing times around her presence being there. I wouldn't talk to her too much. I'm just exposing what some of you guys are already doing. No! Amen? Amen. Well, we'll talk later. We'll talk later. Amen? Some of you guys, some of you guys are like, oh, dang, that was for me. That was for me. But I, I got so much discipling, but you know what was true? You know what I, how I knew I, it was a genuinely, it, it, I had a pure desire because it was nothing that I wanted from her. I told myself and prayed this to God. I said, God, if it was just her presence that I had and just our friendship forever, I'd be fired up about that. Because I enjoy being around my wife. This is truly my best friend. I want to do everything with her. I want to, I want to do the, the nothing with her. When I schedule nothing, I'm like, well, it's time to go do it with my wife. Amen? Let's just go do nothing together. That's, what I, that's my friend right there. You know, in the same way we pursue these love interests and all these different things, we should have that same pursuit of God. 
Where if it was just his presence that you received, that should be enough. That should be sufficient. That should bring you joy. That should fill your day. That should give you the strength and the energy to conquer whatever comes in the day. Because let me tell you something. Satan can confuse your desires as the sole thing you should focus on. And I'm talking even in the kingdom. But we've got to be able to refocus and re-rivet our attention back on the creator. It's time for us as the Metro Coast. If we're going to go on and do even greater things, it's time to renew our pursuit. My challenge for you from this point is to talk to your discipler. Get open and ask them, what's limiting my pursuit? What do you see in me that I'm pursuing more than I'm pursuing God? And then change. For those that are our guests here this morning, this life is an unfulfilled one without God. You ever notice that everything you do is not enough? God says he intentionally does that so you can focus and question, where is more? And you'll find that more, you'll find that enough with God. Yeah. My challenge for you if you're our guests here, if anybody invited you out, I want to challenge you to study the Bible and figure out what does it biblically look like to pursue God with all your heart. Are you guys with me right here? My second and final point, turn over here back to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, in verse 12, my second point for you is renewed purpose. Philippians 3, in verse 12, it says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind... And straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. You know, Paul here, after he... Talks about how he just wants to know Christ. He says, you know, as my life goes on, I just want to complete the task that was given. I want to complete the purpose for which God has sent me. And he for sure knew his purpose at his calling here on earth. It was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And bring the gospel before the Gentiles and their kings. And we understand from history, Paul would be able to do that as the close of the book of Acts. He had proclaimed the gospel to every creature under heaven. He was able to say, just as it says in Acts 13, 36, that when J David's life was finished, it was because he fulfilled his purpose here on earth. And Paul at the close of his life could say, I've completed my purpose here on earth. I can go out in a blaze of glory. And I can say I gave everything that I've got because I have a renewed purpose. What would have been along that journey as Paul would have fought to fulfill his purpose? Let's look over here at Philippians 1. It says in Philippians 1, Philippians 1 and verse 21, it says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. 
You see, Paul taught here, he says, you know what? If I'm going to live this life here on earth, it's going to mean one focus. One thing that I'm guaranteed to do is I'm going to have fruitful labor in the Lord. I'm going to live out my purpose. You know, when you do the first point and really connect to your pursuit with God, you get close to the heart of God. And the heart of God is what? What says in Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Amen. And in Colossians 1, 15 through 18, it teaches that he is the head of the body, which is the church. So if that's the head's purpose, the body's purpose should be that of the same thing. Everybody's purpose as a sold out disciple should be focused on the fruitful labor of seeking and saving lost souls. Paul's heart was focused. And when some would say he didn't have much access to the outside world. But he made no excuse about that. He said in the midst of this prison, in the midst of these shackles, in the midst of this dungeon that I'm currently in, it's fine. I'll make it happen. I'm going to maximize what God has given me because even in this, God's name will be glorified. Okay, I don't have much people to preach to. Well, the people, the same people I see every day are going to hear the same message every day. You're like, man, well, I'm at work and I see the same people. Well, you got to learn how to switch it up. You got to learn how to revert the, the, the attention. Talk about a random topic that leads back to God. Well, I, my campus is dead. No worries. You just keep talking to the same people over and over again. And Lord willing, at some point, their hearts will turn as you're cordial, kind, and compassionate. And they'll come on out to Bible talk. And they'll study the Bible. But Paul says here, I'm going to make it happen. Not because I'm an evangelist. Not because I'm an apostle. Not because people are looking to me for my example. Simply because I've been called by God to be a sold out disciple. See, Paul simplified things. He said, I've done a lot. I've lived a long life. But I'm still breathing. And there are souls still waiting. And so I'm going to keep preaching. Why did he have this heart? Let's look over here at Romans 8. It's the best when Elliot says it. You just, you just, vamos hermano. We love all nations, amen. We love all nations. It's incredible. It makes me happy. It's the evidence that we're the kingdom, amen? In Romans 8 and verse 18, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. And brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. I love this passage because it exemplifies the heart of Paul as he got his heart from the heart of Jesus. He says, I look at the world. And it may not be, I can hear them actually, but you can sense the crying out of creation. As they're waiting in eager expectation for somebody to come. And just ask them if they want to study the Bible. Ask them if they want to know Christ. Ask them if they want to know how much God loves them. And if they want to sit down and get into his word to find out the truth. You see, he says, our present sufferings. Let me let you know, guys. We, as a family here in the Metro Coast, we're taking hits. We're taking hits from all angles. And the Bible would teach us here that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the future glory that will be revealed. And what is to bring God glory? It says in John 15, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So what is that glory that's worth suffering for? The same way Paul says in Thessalonians, what is my crown, what is my glory? Is it not you? It is the souls of our brothers and sisters that come into the kingdom and it is all the souls that are waiting for us to go to them and bring them into God's glorious kingdom. This 
is the purpose we've been commissioned by our Lord. I am honored to be a son of the Most High God. I am honored that God would see it fit, that he would allow me so close to him, I can know the heart of God. And I am honored that I have a hand in playing a part in the great scheme and great dream of God to evangelize the world in this generation. Now, some may ask, man, that sounds like works. You sound like you're working for the being saved. No, 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 no. There is nothing I could have done to prove that I was worthy of salvation. But God still saw it fit to drag me out of darkness and bring, him in, bring me into the light. And so I'm not saved because I work, but I am saved to work. Amen? I'm saved to work for God. And I'm grateful to do it. I'm so honored to play a part in seeing souls come into God's kingdom. We saw the souls that were standing up here during the announcements. What would you not do? What would you be unwilling to go at what length to not see more souls come stand on this stage? That's not about you. That's not about me. That's bringing glory to our God. I'm ready to renew and fight to live out my purpose. And I'm excited. You know, I got to lift up a couple of examples that really set the pace in this. You know, our dear brother, Femi. Yeah. Olua Femi. Yeah. Now, somebody asked, where, where is Femi right now? Well, well, through the month of August, the UCLA football players do have training all through Sunday. And so what I gave him the commission to do as our D-time Friday, I said, bro, you have the Cal guys who we baptize at Berkeley, Isaiah and Mo, who have the similar schedule so I said you know you and Josh you guys need to jump on a call with them too and you need to have your own church service on Sundays and so each Sunday they're gonna rotate the preaching see if Josh wants to jump in there a little bit but we're gonna see a vast amount of fruit come from the sports teams but you know what Femi persevered and he never ceases to share his faith I'm so proud of that young man he's such an inspiration and you know what? He's so humble about it. He never complains about serving, even though he has a rigorous schedule more than a lot of us can really imagine. But he makes no excuse. You know, I also got to lift up Mama Cecilia. I, I, I think, when I think of, of a fiery ball of just evangelism, let me tell you something. If we had 10 more Cecilias, this, we couldn't be here anymore next week. Next week, we'd have to get out of here. But let me tell you something. Mama Cecilia, she's going to share her faith. She's going to make an excuse to share her faith. She's going to find a way to do it. Like, if there's a lot going on, she's like, well, let's, let's uh, take care of the PMEs outside in a lot where there's a bunch of people. I just share my faith there. She's going to make it happen. The moment an opportunity or an evening is open, she's like, we're sharing our faith that night. I know it. And then she pulls back and she's like, right, Martin? It's okay. <laughs> and Martin's like, of course, honey. And they are fired up disciples in the West. Who else do I got to lift up? I got to lift up Jacob. You know, Jacob, Jacob is an incredible example. In the Southland, I mean, this guy truly fights and leads the way in a lot of ways. He's fruitful, but the guy never makes an excuse to work hard for God. And who else? His co-leader, Jenna. They work so hard. They work so hard and they set the example of living out their purpose for God. And it's not about whatever they can get out of it. It's just simply from a place of pure gratitude. You know, I appreciate Mama Sharon sharing about Vinny's lesson here at the banquet in the, at the LAMC. I was so impacted by that lesson when he preached Luke 16. And how in that account, Lazarus is with Abraham and the rich man is trying to reach and just say, hey, please just tell my family to truly study the Bible. Tell them to get right with God. And Abraham says, not even if somebody resurrected from the dead would they believe. But they have Moses and the prophets to have their best opportunity to believe. Giving us the insight that 
even if a miraculous event were to happen, doesn't guarantee somebody's going to put their faith in God. But because we carry the sword of the truth, this guarantees an anchor for their soul that would guarantee them citizenship in heaven. But he preached about how his grandfather passed before he was a disciple. And after studying the Bible, realizing the magnitude of that situation. And Vinny's last name is Rodriguez, so I call him Primo. It's my cousin. It's my cousin in the spirit, amen? Ever since I went to Brazil, it's like, we're cousins. It's, it's just, and they were, they were shouting like, primo, primo, primo. And it was amazing. But it was so impactful how much that turned Vinny's perspective. And he said, I'm not going to have any more of my family thinking that they would be in that position. Let me tell you, the best evangelizers are sitting in hell. Because if they could say anything, they would not stop to share their faith. They would not quit. They would not make excuses about how much work they have. They would not make excuses about their kids' schedules. They would not make excuses about, I have to nanny this amount of times in the day. They would stay up late. They would get up early. They would do whatever it takes. Why? Because this is all that we've got. And when it's real for you, when hell is a real place for you, you'll fight tooth and nail to let no one go there. And after that, his grandmother got baptized, his mom and dad got baptized, and his family was now into the kingdom. And I never related more. Because about three and a half years ago, I got a frantic call from my cousin that my grandmother had suddenly died. Slipped, hit her head, and died. I was so in shock. But you know what stuck with me the most? I never shared my faith with my grandma. I never opened my mouth. Then I did her funeral. I was the only disciple present. I was alone in the agony to actually know where my grandmother is. It broke my heart. But I knew what I needed to do. I knew the decision I needed to make. I knew that this pain could stop with me if I would choose to reach out to somebody's grandmother, to somebody's grandson, so he could save his grandmother. I remember I got back to San Francisco after completing that funeral, and I preached a lesson titled, How Are You Gonna Respond? And I utilize Mark 6 because you see that after John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who a lot of scholars believe is his rabbi in a lot of ways, after he gets beheaded and Jesus gets the news, how does Jesus respond? It says he, re, re, he secludes to a solitary place, but then he feeds 5,000 people, making no excuse, taking his time, but then going and pouring out that compassion, that fire, that zeal, that indignation towards the darkness, and that compassion on the lost, towards all the lost souls, so they can have a chance to not experience the pain that he experienced, but experience the glory of his family, of their family, of our families coming into, the God, into God's kingdom. And after that, I got dead set on studying the Bible with my mom. I said, I'm not going to let that happen anymore. I can't handle doing it. I, told, I remember getting on the phone with my mom, and she said, you know, when I die, I want to have a celebration. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, I don't feel comfortable about doing not a funeral for none of you guys right now. I don't feel comfortable with that. And I said, Mom, I'm begging you, just allow me to show you the scriptures. Let me just show you what God has shown me. And I'm telling you, Mom, it's different than what, it, what we grew up doing. It's different. It's the Bible. I never knew the Bible. We don't know the Bible. 
we studied the Bible, and after about three months, my mom was baptized August 5th of 2020. And I'm so grateful that now, just yesterday, was my mom's third spiritual birthday. This is why we do what we do. This is why we pour ourselves out. This is why we give everything we've got. This is why we get exhausted for it. Because how many Aubreys are worth it? How many Galilas are worth it? How many Tashambes are worth it? How many Trays are worth it? How many Fintons are worth it? How many, how many of us are worth it? All of us are worth it. Let's renew our purpose. Let's have perspective going into this half of the year. Let's really gather and take all the courage and excitement we've received from all the miracles that God has done in the first half. Over 280 baptisms. That's just the beginning. Now it's time to go into the second half. And I want to challenge every disciple in this room. Because I believe that we can do this. Every disciple by the end of the year gets personally fruitful. Every disciple gets personally fruitful fruitful. Well, I haven't been strong. God will get you there. You go have yourself a good quiet time. You get open, get some discipling, renew that pursuit, and I guarantee you you'll be able to renew that purpose as well. Well, 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 I haven't been fruitful in a long time. No worries. Anything can get done with faith, focus, and accountability. If you really have a conviction in seeking to save the lost, God will bless that if you pray as if it all depends on him and work as if it all depends on you. You can do this, we can do this, and the Metro Coast can go from 270 disciples to 350 disciples by the end of the year. I believe it. In Ephesians 3, let's close out here. It says in verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, then all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. God says here through the apostle Paul that he wants to do immeasurably more. That limitless was not just a conference to be had, but it was a lifestyle to be lived. That we share because we care. That we pursue because it's our purpose to be with God for eternity, forever. Yeah. That when we get on that last day, you'll look around and you won't look in regret. But you'll look and be able to thank God that you were able to pour yourself out and see every nation under heaven with you getting that last tear by God wiped. And we'll be able to say, that we gave everything we've got because God wants immeasurably more. But until then, it's time to be renewed with God. I love you and to God be all the glory.